So today I'm, I'm talking about mobile, ma mobile malware and I'm keeping the focus mainly on Android uh, just because it, it is <clears throat> the predominant target with mobile malware. Uh, to target iOS, it tends to be a lot more high-end malware, like looking for zero days, things like that. Um, there have been some more recent attacks where they're abusing and leveraging like database backends and functionality. Uh, but for today, we're going to stick with Android. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the mobile malware uh, threat landscape. And I'm going to do some analysis, uh, an analysis demo. So it'll show you how, if you want to get started, reverse in mobile, how you can do that. And then if we have time at the end, I actually have um, uh, one of my favorite kits, the AdWind Remote Access Trojan. I'm going to show you how easy it is to build the malware. I'm not trying to turn anybody into criminals. I feel like you're being set up for this talk, Devon. Like there's a lot of questionable content going around. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to create any criminals. I'm just trying to to highlight the fact that there's a lower uh, bar of entry now for, for cyber attackers and criminals. I always like to start my talk off with the, the tools and the people that have influenced my journey um, and the resources that I think are phenomenal for helping you grow. When it comes to mobile, this, this slide right here will help you get started with just about everything you want. Uh, and I'll share these slides after the talk if there are questions and interaction. If it's not social, I don't share. Just I'm just putting that out there. Um, so uh, some of the tools, Jenny Motion is by far my favorite emulator. Uh, if you've ever tried to run an emulator inside a virtual machine, it's an inception type situation and it's awful. Just it's 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 just super painful. Jenny Motion actually leverages VirtualBox. Jenny Motion is free. VirtualBox is free. So if you're setting up your home lab, these two interact together. Um, Jenny Motion will only run on VirtualBox, and it doesn't run inside the virtual machine. Um, it, it's more, um, it relies on VirtualBox, but it stands it up as a, a separate device. And I'll show you that later on in the demo. Uh, for me, that's been the easiest way to do a lot of malware analysis. Uh, if you really want to use a VM, the app use VM, uh, again, is free, and that's been one of the least painful VMs to work in. And then the rest of these are different tools um, that you'll see later on in the talk. So like JD GUI, APK tool, using Android debug bridge, uh, things like that. And then the last you hear, if you're looking for some malware, virusshare.com and hybrid analysis, uh, you can go download all the malware that you want for free. Uh, if, you, if you're a member of VirusTotal, you can download malware there for a subscription, but these guys don't charge you anything. So you can get all kinds of malware, not just mobile. And then on the right-hand side, these are some of the smartest folks in the mobile space right now. now. Uh, Heather Mahalik, Digital Forensics, Mobile Digital Forensics, just phenomenal. She has a free blog. Um, Caleb Fenton does a lot of uh, deobfuscation tools, things like that will help you. Um, Adam and Christoph are doing a lot of great things in the Intel space on mobile. And then Powell has this great YouTube video uh, that I used a lot when I was first starting out with mobile, like learning the basics and stepping through. So if you're hungry for more knowledge, this is a slide that you want <clears throat> to revisit. So as we jump into mobile, it's important to understand how an app is built. So it starts with Java source code or Kotlin now. Uh, then it's compiled. And then you can see here the jar libraries are added to the class files. Then it's compiled um, right here into a Dalvik executable. So this is what contains Dalvik bytecodes that allows it to communicate with the Android device. So whenever we look at the AdWin RAT later, you'll see it's built with Java and it's a, it's a cross-platform. So in order to take that particular RAT and port it to Android, you will have to compile it with Dalvik bytecode so that the Android device can understand what it's saying. Yes. And, and then from here, you use the Android asset packaging tool and that's what converts it into an APK. Now, at this point, whenever you use the packaging tool, this is where it takes your images, your layouts, some of your fancy graphics, and it compiles that in with the source code itself. And we'll see this resources file later when we reverse uh, one of the apps. And then after you have the APK, then you have to sign it. And then that's where you end up with your signed APK. Now, don't just trust it because it's a signed APK. It's a self-signed certificate. So anybody signs it. You know, anybody can say it, it's not a validation that it's a legit, it's a legit app. It's just another step in the process. It's important to understand this, 
this uh, particular process because this is what we're going to do when we reverse it. So as we step back through it, even if you want to pen test your app, uh, this is the same process that you want to follow to, to pen test your app. So now we're going to step into who's using mobile malware. So e-crime actors have been you know, targeting mobile for quite a while. But we've also seen a lot of nation state actors get into the business of targeting mobile. It's the largest attack surface in the world. In my opinion, it's the least protected uh, attack surface in the world. You don't have 50,000 antivirus you know, software options for it. Um, the other thing is users tend to have this false sense of security when it comes to mobile devices. We click anything, we download anything. It's a mobile phone, right? It's, it's protected. Like we, we're a little less security conscious on mobile devices. So to me, that kind of opens it up as an attack surface. Now on the left-hand side here, uh, this was uh, from 2015, and this was the Adwin rat. This is the rat that I'm going to show you at the end of the talk. There was um, an Argentinian prosecutor who, who had been murdered. Uh, this is all crime and intrigue too, right? It's a, it's a dark Thursday night. I got to put some drama into this talk because not everybody loves malware, but I love malware. Um, so they found this Argentinian prosecutor who had been murdered and some security uh, researchers had gotten a hold of his phone and started investigating it. And they found that some actors had been tracking this particular prosecutor using AdWin. So they had been logging his text messages, recording his voice, tracking his geolocation, his emails, his text messages. I mean, it's pretty much a full remote access Trojan on a mobile device. So there was some attribution done by this particular, um, these particular security groups and tying it back to nation state actors. So that was one of the first uh, early cases that we saw of confirmed or uh, alleged uh, APT actors using mobile. And more recently, there was a campaign where Hamas uh, actors were targeting Israeli soldiers, uh, mobile devices using fake Facebook accounts, all of it again on mobile devices. <clears throat> In this case, they were deploying the Viper Rat and they were using third-party sites to drop the malware onto the phone. And more recently, uh, this ties back into some of the stuff that Joe was talking about with COVID being used to target. We commonly see actors using whatever's in the headline news, you know, whatever's going to get them the most um, coverage from an attack standpoint uh, to, to target users. And this is the same in the mobile space. Look out security. That's where um, um, Christoph and, and those guys work had published a blog where they found Libyan and Syrian targets uh, being targeted using the Syrian Electronic Army infrastructure. Uh, and it was it was deploying COVID-related apps. And these apps were actually installing RAT or Android server or um, different uh, type of monitoring surveillance malware onto the mobile devices in the background. And you can see on this image here, you know, the user would put their fingerprint here and it would do a fake temperature reading on them. And then what it's really doing in the background is installing a remote access Trojan. And this was linked back to nation state actors, again, using infrastructure, TTPs, and a lot of the common things. Uh, there was also a mobile malware family that came out that was using a COVID-19 tracker early on. And that one was more of a, a commodity malware. So it was looking to uh, be an, it was an information stealer looking to steal uh, credentials. So one of the things um, that we see commonly with the traditional actors is using techniques like watering hole, things like that. So kind of controlling the flow of the infected uh, using different parameters on the on the system. So using IPs, um, geolocation, things like that to navigate where you want the malware to drop. In this case, this was an Andro rat case from 2016. And here, when they had the infected mobile devices do the check-in, you can see with the IMEI code right here, this 06 basically means that the device was made in China, Hong Kong, or Mexico. So when the device checked in to the command control server, if, if it matched this IMEI, it would redirect it to this particular IP right here for the command and control. However, if it checked in with this IMEI, which in the indicator is made in the US or Finland, it sent it to a different IP address, and then everything else is sent to this IP. So this is a, a way where we're seeing a lot of the typical techniques uh, adopted uh, into the mobile space. And here's how you can check 
uh, if you if you get your device, you can pull your IMEI, and there's a, a couple different sites you can go on the internet, and it'll tell you it'll tell you your phone model, it'll tell you your brand, uh, it'll tell you your geolocation where it was made, and I believe if I remember correctly, they did this because the standards of manufacturing in China, Hong Kong, and Mexico are a little bit different than that of the U.S. and the Finland in Finland, so they may have been looking for a supply chain um, um, vulnerability. Another interesting technique that we've seen them use is kind of like an anti-security, anti-sandboxing. Uh, they want to make it, again, difficult for security researchers to reverse this. In this particular case, I thought this was pretty, pretty genius, so that's why I included it. They use the accelerometer, so your counts on your phone, like how many steps you've taken. And if it's less than 10,000, the malware won't run. So they pretty much know if you're running in an emulator, you're not going to have any steps on your device, right? So at this point, if you're a security researcher, you have a couple of options. You can either write a script that will inject like the fake um, count of steps, or you can take your phone on a walk around your building, uh, one of the two. But this is one of the creative ways that they're leveraging the phone's functionality to prevent reversing uh, or anti-security. All right, so at this point, we'll hop into some of the demos. I'm going to show you guys how to reverse some. Oh, but before we do that, I wanted to show you this particular uh, interesting packet capture that I have from one of the commodity um, mobile families. So this is Marcher, and it was specifically designed to steal uh, credentials from banking. So this was PCAP captured off of a device, and this is the check-in with the C2. So this is the this is a check-in. This is one of the check-ins that it did to the C2. This is the data that is passing back about your data about your phone. So you can see it's passing back that it's an Android. Uh, it tells you the country. Here's the IMEI number again. So it tells you whether or not the user is admin. Um, let's see. And then I think this is the one. It tells you about the package name. So right here, this is the malware. So on the phone, this is how you would find it. And I'll show you a little bit more about package names when we get into reversing. Uh, this is the version name, the version code of the malware. And then this is what it calls itself. So Flash 469. A lot of the mobile malware, the e-commodity stuff, it's pretending to be Flash Player. Um, Especially as Flash Player starts to phase out their support, we're probably going to see more and more of this. But if you're not downloading Flash Player from Adobe's website, you're probably downloading malware. So if you want to go get some malware to test out in reverse, just search for Adobe Flash Player and then download whatever you come across. And it's probably going to be malware. So here's the check-in. Again, it wants you to upload all the phone numbers from the device. And some more check-in. But where it starts to get interesting is right here. The C2 says, okay, uh, you're a valid phone. You're logged in. Can you tell me if any of these applications are installed on the device? Because these guys are very specific in what they want to target. They have certain overlays created for different banking sites and different e-commerce sites, kind of like what Joe had mentioned earlier, um, you know, with them targeting Etsy, which I love Etsy, so that kind of hit close to home. Uh, but if they're going after Etsy, they're going to want to include it here because they're going to have built an overlay to, to pull off that uh, specific login data. So you can see down through here, this is a fairly lengthy list of checks. So I'm just going to go a little bit quicker because it's checking for a lot, but that's still not every single e-commerce or financial site in the world. And here's the command that you'll see from the, the malware when it says check the apps. And then it'll pass it back and say, this phone has this particular app installed. And then the C2 server will serve up um, an update for the malware that will allow it to do the cred captures. <clears throat> hey, Marita, we had a question. Um, I don't know if this is a good time to ask it. Um, Chris, uh, I think it's Drepart. Uh, how do you intercept package uh, from the mobile 
So that's actually a great question. Uh, and it took me a little while. That's a painful question. So if you're running an emulator, what I ended up doing was I ran Jenny Motion with the virtual with the virtual box integration and ran Wireshark. Because uh, the other thing, whenever you're setting up Jenny Motion, VirtualBox automatically gives it two interfaces. So you have to be careful with that. If you don't want to talk into the interwebs, you have to shut off that second interface. It does it by default, which makes me nervous. But I just set up Wireshark to do the capture between those. Otherwise, there's there's some third-party apps that you can install on the phone itself that do a limited type packet capture, but those are kind of painful to, to move on and off the device, and I don't feel like they're as robust as using Wireshark. So another thing, uh, did that answer the question? Is that good? I think so. Okay. Uh, another thing that these guys like to check is they like to check the battery level because if you run your battery level at 100% all the time, they just assume that you're in an emulator because everybody has a battery drop at some point. So at, at this point, uh, the battery level is set to 89%. And again, this was done in an emulator and with Jenny Motion and a lot of the emulators, you can set and adjust your battery level. So you never really want your battery level running at 100% all the time. You want to probably bring it down to something more realistic. So this is another data point that they extract. This is where it downloads from the C2 server. It downloads a zip which contains all of the overlays for all those banks that we just saw. And what I thought was interesting about this campaign is they do it based on geolocation. So whenever you check in, if you're in the U.S. like we were, they only package up overlays specific to the U.S. and specific to the phone. So it keeps that zip, that zip that they're downloading, it keeps it really tight and compact, which if you think, of, if you think about it, that's really smart um, because it's not consuming a lot of bandwidth. It's probably not going to flag your users versus if you have a giant bloated zip file with every single uh, overlay that you can find. So scrolling down through here, there was also... There's two more things I want to show you on this one before we move into reversing. One is right here. So Google came up with this technology called Safety Net, and it was a mitigation. So what happens is when the commodity malware will launch on the device, the malware will launch what we call an overlay, and it will run on top of the app. Well, Google created this check called Safety Net, which will look to see if there's an overlay on top of the legit app, and then it won't let the legitimate app launch. So in theory, that kills the legit app so the actors can't steal um, the credentials. These actors realized that this was mitigation and built this into their, into their checks. So here is checking to see if Safety Net is enabled or disabled. And I had it disabled because I wanted the attack to be successful. But if it's enabled, that forces the actor to reevaluate how they're going to manipulate the device. So just like they do a lot of checking with endpoint malware, they're doing the same checking on mobile. Does anyone have any idea or does anyone recognize uh, this? I'll give you a clue. It's encoding. Does anyone recognize this encoding down here? I had no idea what it was. There's no shame in this. I was like, I have no idea. This just looks like weird randomness. Um, it's base 85. Oh. And I know everybody's like Googling base 85 now. Like what, what the, what is base 85? It's, it's an Adobe uh, encoding used for PDFs, but these guys were clever. They know that everybody's looking for base 64. We're looking for, you know, all this clever, super, um, super amazing encoding encryption. They're just like, let's throw some base 85 on it. I swear, I think they went to CyberChef and just clicked down through the encoding until they found something that looked cool and used that for their C2 check-in. But if you take these two right here and you and you throw them in and you um, decode them from base 85, it gives you the C2 check-in. So from bypassing security and confusing security researchers, I thought this was a super clever technique for updating their C2. So if you guys see anything like this come flying across the wire on your malware, um, test it out and see if it's base 85. 
Hey, Marita, Marita, we had another question. Okay. Um, how does uh, mobile malware protection apps like Malware Bytes protect the mobile devices against these malwares? So that's, it's a lot like asking about antivirus vendors protecting you from endpoint, right? So it depends on the level of technology that they use, the techniques that they use. Are they doing heuristics? Are they just doing hashing? Um, a, a lot of times, the best way to protect yourself from this is just don't install helper apps. You know, don't install um, flashlight apps, battery saver apps, um, flash player apps, you know, things like that. To me, that rather than just throwing a software solution at it, having a, a very um, keen awareness of what you're putting on your device uh, is, is a lot more helpful. Now, those softwares do have a place and they do provide some, you know, some level of protection. But it's like relying on your antivirus or your firewall to, to protect your, your endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, one more question from Nathan Kim. Um, is the communication between the infected mobile device and C2C server in plain text? Uh, so it, it, that's a great question. So it depends on how the actor has it set up. In this particular case, it was uh, it was not SSL. So it was, I could capture it, but... When you start looking at some of your rats and some of your more advanced actors, they're going to go to SSL and they're going to use like some more complex C2 methods. So it's it's even though it's on a mobile device, it is literally just web traffic. So it's okay. it's the same content uh, concept. These are really great questions. So this is Jenny Motion. So that's the emulator. And then the other thing is if you're just starting out and you want to reverse some malware, Android Studio is a great place to start. Uh, it's free. You can build your own app to start to understand the apps. Um, so this is Android Studio. It's a safe place to reverse uh, APKs. Like you don't have to do it in a virtual machine, which also makes it great. So you can install it right now and just run it. You can see I have like 50 million samples here. Um, so we're going to go ahead. Once you get your, your APK, your malware, you just pre profile or debug it. I'm going to start with sample one here. This is the malware right here. The first place that I always go is the Android manifest file. This is the roadmap of the app. If anything's going to happen in this app, it has to be defined in the manifest file. So, this is the first place you want to look to get a good feel of the malware that you're looking at. So if you look here, I mentioned earlier the package name. So when you install this app on your device, this is how it's going to install. This is the name that it's going to use to install. Now, when you look at legitimate software like Truist, for example, it would be like com.truist. You know, blah, 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 whatever. Or it would look more legit. Here, these look like they're created by a domain, uh, a DGA, or some type of, uh, or they're obfuscated, right? That That's not human readable. So that, to me, is usually sets my spidey senses tingling. So I'm like, okay, this package name is odd. Let me look into it a little bit more. Then you, then you can start scrolling down through here. This is the minimum SDK version. So 13 is super old, but these guys wanted to make sure that they can infect a wide range of devices. So this malware can run on devices that are running uh, SDK version 13 all the way up to 22 with the max of, or this is the target. This is their optimal. So 22 is pretty much what this malware is built for, but they they can go all the way up to, to SDK version 26. So you can see they literally want to hit everybody who has a phone since probably, you know, 2002. This is where we start getting into the permissions. So when you install an app on a phone, um, it, it requires you to grant it permissions. And this kind of goes back to the user awareness. So even if you install or you download Flash Player and you click to run it, and all of a sudden it wants to be able to monitor your microphone, well, there's no reason Flash Player should need access to my microphone. So that's when you start to maybe say, maybe this isn't legit, so let me not give it permissions. So it's like a second fail safe for preventing malware infections. So let's go through these real quick. Um, okay, permission, set to vibrate, broadcast package removed, call the phone, 
change the Wi-Fi state to me is a little suspicious because depending on the app, why would an app need to change my Wi-Fi state? Why would it need, if I have it turned off or in airplane mode or anything like that, why would, why would an app need to change that? So again, that depends on the type of app that you just installed. Uh, access Wi-Fi state, read phone state, contacts. A lot of these are kind of passive, so it's they're common. Um, now, when you get down here to things like disable key guard, get task, why would an app need to know what tasks are running on my phone? They're checking for something, right? This is the one that you're really looking for. This is system alert window. This is pretty much going to give it the ability to run an overlay on top of whatever app you have going. So if you see system alert window, um, I would dig deeper into this because you're probably looking at some type of overlay malware or some super dodgy third-party app that the developer, I don't know, created with some weird permissions. But odds are um, you're looking at some overlay malware. So at this point, I, you know, I, between this and the dodgy package name, I'm like, okay, this is probably malware, and I'm going to start tearing it apart a little bit more. So those, you can look through the rest of this. This is more about like the receivers and the intents and how it's interacting with the user and the phone. But at this point, you pretty much got a good feeling that you're looking at some kind of malware. So let's dig around a little bit. Just like with traditional malware, sometimes you throw a Hail Mary and you get lucky with strings, right? It doesn't happen always, but you love it when it does. So in this particular case, when I looked at the strings for this, I'm like, I got a C2. It's my lucky day. So then you can run some intel on that C2. And this was Red Alert. Uh, by the way, if you see any kind of Android malware with 7878 as the port for the check-in, it's been my experience that that's usually Red Alert which is an information stealer. It's one of the big, uh, it was one of the big information stealers. I, I think the actor got arrested or took a vacation or something because it went offline for a little while. This was one of the first mobile malwares that used Twitter as a check-in. So here you can see this string where he's using Twitter, uh, a Twitter account for his, his C2 check-in. And then down here at the bottom, let me see. He's also using the uh, the time API to do a check, uh, a time check. So again, information they use is the pass back during the infection. So you don't always get this lucky with strings, but it's always worth a quick look. So again, this is that resources file. So if you come back here to where we looked at how the APK is built, those were added right here. So during this last phase, so now we're going to pull up a different sample. And this is going to be sample two. I also have a, a GitHub page where I share some malware samples too if you want um, if you want to grab some of these samples and look at them as well. So we start again with the manifest file. Another dodgy looking package name. Overlay, so this has to run on top of all the other apps. That's interesting. Why would this app need to kill all the background processes? Why would it need the ability to kill anything on my phone? Or write to my external storage? Or write to my internal storage? All right. This one looks weird enough for me. Now we're going to take a quick look at the file structure itself. So whenever you're looking at the package name, this is how you navigate it like a file structure. So when you're looking at the Java, we click here. Notice this is the first part of the file. And then here is the next layer of the file structure. So this is our source code. If you look at the naming convention of the files, this means that these actors use ProGuard for obfuscation. ProGuard is a, it's a free uh, obfuscation. It's very limited in its capacity. But anytime that you see single character or double character naming conventions for your Java files, that means that they use ProGuard. 
And the guy that I mentioned earlier, Caleb Fenton, has some tools that will help you reverse or deobfuscate the ProGuard. So as you can see, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of difficult to read through. We'll come back here, we'll check our strings. The only thing we can really see in strings here is, again, this is an Adobe Flash player. Uh, it probably asks for some kind of Google Play permissions. So not a lot in the strings there. So we'll go look at our resources files. And I'm going straight to the XML because I've already dug through this and for the sake of time, I don't, you know, I don't want you guys to spend the time that I did. So if we look at this XML file that was again added at this point in the process. So after all the code had been created, this was added here at this, this point before it's packaged together. It's saying it uses these policies. It forces a lock, it resets a password, it wipes data, it limits the password, it watches your log on, it disables your camera, and it encrypts your storage. We have any guesses on what this malware might be? Anybody know of any malware that likes to lock up your system and encrypt all your files? Some, some ransomware. Some ransomware, yep. So that's it. same same techniques on mobile. So now for fun, let's grab this sample here. Hey Marita, how prevalent is ransomware on mobile devices right now? Is that are you seeing a rise in that or what's going on? It's I would say it's on par with with uh, the trends that were. I don't know if you guys just heard that thunder. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Um, the uh, it's on par with the endpoint ransomware. The actors. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's fairly prevalent. It doesn't seem to make the news quite as much as like hospitals that are being overrun with ransomware, things like that, yeah. just because it's hitting people one or two at a time. Uh, but it is it is just as prevalent. Like that, the COVID tracker I mentioned earlier, the global mm -hmm. COVID tracker, that dropped ransomware. Mm. Yeah, okay. so... So this is me putting malware on the, the emulator here. So a lot of times whenever you install this, it prompts you for permissions and they won't let you out of this loop until you give them permissions. Like I, so I just installed the malware, like I downloaded it. I want to get out of it. It should come back up in a minute and prompt me to see it until I enable Google play services. It will not let me out of this loop. And you can see here the permissions, some of the permissions it's, it's asking for, for the Google play. Okay. So I turned on Google play. Oh, before we do that, like I reminded you, here's VirtualBox. Make sure you go to Adapter 2 and turn it off unless you want internet connectivity. Right now, Adapter 1 is only allowing VirtualBox to talk within the emulator. Whenever you want to reach out to your C2 and download whatever communications, if you want it to operate like live malware, then you change this. But just be aware, again, it automatically sets it to internet connected when it launches. So here's your ransomware. We just broke the phone with the ransomware that we looked at. So in this particular campaign, they'll tell you if you've paid. They'll check to see if you've paid. If you don't know where to get Bitcoin, they're super helpful. They tell you where to go get Bitcoin. Uh, they tell you it's worldwide, uh, how to get it. And there's no way to get out of this. Once... Um, once you've been infected with ransomware, uh, you can do a factory reset on the device. So it's pretty much going to wipe everything. This is where I recommend doing frequent backups to the cloud. Um, just so if you do have to do a factory reset, you don't lose all your data. Now, if you're a security researcher, one of the ways that you can get around it is you can use ADB. Let me see. So if you have if the device has Android debugging enabled, which most devices don't because you don't want that remote access, but if you're doing this in your lab, you'll have ADB enabled. Right here is the device itself. It's running on quad five.
So these are all the apps that are installed on the phone. So if someone walks in and hands you a phone that's been bricked with ransomware and you don't know where to go from here, you know, connect it, try to do some ADB commands on it. And then this is a lot, right? Well, not a lot to, for an average user, but if you do, if you do a dash three, this will show you all the third party apps that were installed. So these are all the ones that were installed by the user themselves. And we can see our, our uh, recently installed malware right here with this package name. So you can try to uninstall it. Hopefully I'm not a little, a little rusty on these commands. All right. So it didn't let you uninstall it, right? Because these guys are smart. They prevented any kind of external device connection. They prevented any kind of uninstall. What about we disable it? They didn't think about that. So and this was something I discovered when I was uh, trying to bypass it, is you can't uninstall it because they've anticipated that, but you can disable it because Android has these security features where you need to be able to maybe disable an app on the fly. So it doesn't completely uninstall, it doesn't completely uninstall the malware, but it disables it. So if you look, you'll still see you'll still see it's on the device. So we can re-enable it just like we disabled it. And so we should see the ransomware kick up again. Sometimes these guys are so invasive with the malware that it will, it will completely just destroy the device. But in this video, there we go. In this particular case, what you would do as an incident responder is disable the ransomware and then uninstall it. But before you uninstall it, you can pull it back to your, um, to your analysis system. So you would have the APK that you wanted to study offline. So again, we disable it, it's gone. And now let's try to run our uninstall command. And it was successful. So that's one way, if you have uh, debugging enabled, that's one way to kind of get around. Uh, but just be warned, if you enable debugging on your device, you could open yourself up to more serious attacks. The, uh, there was an actor that took the Mirai botnet scanning module and converted it where it would look for open ADB ports. So it would scan for quad five, and then it would basically worm Android malware using quad five. So if you had enabled Android bug bridge, you're basically going to infect, get infected by this, this particular malware using the Mirai uh, scanning module. How are we doing on time? Okay. I love talking malware, Devon. So you got to wave me. You, like yeah. I, I go, when I go to happy hours, my friends are like, you're so weird. Stop talking about mobile malware. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to wave me down. When <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I'm getting a little lost in it myself. Uh, Cause I, I've, forgot the check time um i mean honestly we can go a little longer um maybe five or ten minutes um okay but you know obviously if anybody needs to drop they certainly can but this is a, a really quality session so i think we'll be in okay. talks to see if we can get you on, on, a, on a saturday all day session at some point what i will talk mauer all day every day awesome <laughs> that and awesome. jeeps right that and jeeps all right all right, so for the folks who are going to stick around then, for the last couple minutes, we'll do something really cool. Um, you know, Joe mentioned Zeus earlier in his talk. That was my, that's my all-time favorite malware family. Um, those guys created a commodity and um, modularized malware in, in a way that, from a business perspective, like, they were very smart. So Zeus has always been my favorite malware family to analyze, but... Uh, over the couple of, past couple of years, I've really grown to respect the actors that created AdWind. And I'm not saying this because I'm glamorizing them or like I, I, you know, I'm not glorifying criminals, but from a technical standpoint, um, you know, the, the, the level of sophistication that goes into some of this malware, I think you have to respect it um, if you're truly going to analyze it and if you're truly going to mitigate it. 
So in this case, I'm going to show you guys how easy it is to create malware. And the reason I like AdWin is because with the sample that I'm going to, I'm going to show you right here, with the exact same jar file, I can infect Windows, Linux, Mac, Android. It doesn't matter. It's completely cross-platform. And again, this is the same remote access Trojan that they found on that, uh, the dead Argentinian prosecutor's phone. So it's leaked, it's portable, um, and it, it's very, very capable. So I have the jar file, and I'm operating inside my virtual machine right now, so this is not live. So I'm launching the builder. So this, as a criminal, this is what you would see. So this is your AdWin builder. And this is a couple of years old. They have a lot more functionality in the new builds. I'm going to create a new server. This is where you put your C2 server information. So you put your IP address here. These are the default ports that you wanted to check in on. And when it checks in, it uses RC4. Uh, so it's symmetric key. Uh, so I want to change that. So this is my new key, ABC123. You can change that to anything that you want. You can set things here like persistence, so run on startup, where you want it to run in the registry, what you want the name to be, where you want the folder to be, additional plugins. Um, if you want it to be anti-VirtualBox or anti-VMware, I would say I'm not going to click these because we want it to run in a VM. Um, but again, depending on how much money the actor is willing to pay will determine the level of functionality that they get out of this malware. Okay, so this is the basic setup. And if you see malware that's running 1505 or 1506, frankly, I'm a little offended because these guys couldn't even put in the effort to change two GUI boxes. So I feel like there's your low-end actors. Like, I, you're wasting my time with your crap malware. Like, you, you know, put some effort into your campaign. So you're probably not looking at someone who's sophisticated. All right. So now we're going to drop this on a desktop. And we're going to call this ISA. Should we call this Devon's malware? He's having a kind of day, right? <laughs> Devon malware. So if it gets loose in the wild, it's going to go back to him, right? Oh, that is that is wonderful. <laughs> hey, at least I'm not trying to compromise the ISSA's website, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now what we want to do is we're going to set up our... <laughs> We delete it. We want to set up our server to listen. So we're going to tell it to listen on 1505, 1506. This is where we put key ABC123. All right. So the server is now listening on these ports. Now I'm in a I'm in an Ubuntu box. So I'm about to infect uh, an Ubuntu box with malware. If I can find. There we go. Hey. Uh Mar uh, Marita, we have a question uh, from John Shaw. Uh, okay. If the bad actor selects an ad when to not run in VirtualBox or VMware, would that render the tools used in forensics demo not usable? So if they if they do choose to use the anti-VM, then you're just going to have to make the modifications to the VM environment to get it to execute. Just like with... Uh, they do registry checks or they'll check processes to see if, you know, if you have virtual machine running or um, different checks like that. Or if uh, some malware, I think the latest Emotet run will even check for debuggers. So it's, it, it'll be a case just like with regular malware where you try to figure out what the actor is looking for and then you modify that in the virtual environment. So if they do check those blocks, it'll prevent it from running until you can figure out how to, how to bypass or suppress that. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a great question. All right. Here we go. Divine officially has a botnet. Congratulations. Thanks, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what it looks like when you have an infected computer. So right here, this tells you the geolocation. So I've infected the box that I'm actually on here. So it uh, I, I like to do this with a Mac. I have a Mac VM. I like to do because I'm a Mac user too, and we get kind of cocky. So sometimes I like to do the demo where I infect a Mac and bring people down a couple pegs. Um, just like iPhone, I like talking about iPhone compromises too. But so here's the botnet name. Uh, this is the IP address. This tells you about the system right here. So this is the system name. 
uh, this is the type of operating system it's running. Tells you the ports over here. But this is where you start having a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of interesting uh, interaction with the system. So you can send it a fake message like um, So you can see this is what would pop up on the user system. They obviously wouldn't see the botnet command control behind it. Uh, so that's where if somebody was trying to do maybe a phone scam thing or trying to, to um, scare a user, they could do that. You can open a URL on the user system. Uh, but these are very interactive. So it's going to alert the user that they're infected. And if you've spent the time and the effort to get a remote access Trojan onto a victim, you're probably not going to send them fake messages and you're not going to open URL. You're not going to be really noisy and go stomping around because you, you're you pretty much wasting uh, a full remote access uh, session. You're more likely to see actors do something like this. This is a screenshot, right? And it's set, you can see it, it just keeps going and going because it's set to run at certain time intervals, time intervals. So it'll pull it back um, to the system and save those images down. So as an actor, you'll always have access to the images that were done with the screen capture. Now that could be helpful from an APT standpoint or a red team standpoint, if you're trying to attack someone and maybe they use encrypted documents and you know that they protect their documents and you know there's, there's no way you can gain access to it. If you have this and you can basically pull screenshots back, then you may be able to get that same information, but just in an image format. The other thing you could do is a uh, is a denial of service, which again it's dumb. If you have a remote access uh, remote access, why would you run a DOS unless you just completely want to burn your botnet? Um, here is where the power of a rat really is. I'm now on my attacker system navigating the file system of the of the victim, so I can do things like I can upload, download, so I can basically exfiltrate any document that I want that's on their system, I can pull it back to my attacker system. I can save it, I can modify it, I can re-upload it, I can do whatever I want, or I can just use it for, for Intel value, right? So just basically information harvesting straight off the system. Uh, so I, to me, I found an interesting way to gain privilege escalation or to kind of move laterally through a network would be you get remote access Trojan on a low priv user, right? Someone who maybe doesn't have a lot of admin, but you're trying to get to your admin guys. So you target payroll or you target HR, or you target um, someone that has access to documents that people trust. So you gain access to their system. You pull back a document that's like, you know, pay scales or something like that, or a memo, you know, that's going to go out to the whole company. You weaponize that with malware. And then you re-upload it back to that user system, even if you're trying to get to the CEO or the VP or something like that. Again, from a, a red team or a pen test perspective, you upload that document back. That trusted user sends that over to the CEO or to the admin, whoever they're sending it to. They're going to trust it, right? It's a trusted user. It's an expected document. They're going to open it, and you have you have an, um, a, priv a, privilege, um, a privileged account at that point. So that's another creative way that you could use this. But a lot of APT actors are going to use this primarily for data exfiltration. So they're going to they're going to go and find the valuable documents and then uh, export those. So you can see here I'm navigating on the the system. Here's the desktop. So let's see here. Let's say this document was like G5 summit information. And I'm just going to download it. Just like that, it just pulls it back to my file structure on my attacker server. So minimal minimal effort on the, the exfil and the upload. The other thing you can do is download and execute additional malware onto the victim. Uh, this would be helpful if you have that initial foothold. You have some custom malware because everybody's looking for Adwin. Use Adwin to get the initial foothold. You drop your custom malware on there. Then you uninstall. So right here, you can uninstall Adwin. And you'll see the botnet's gone. And if you go back to the system, all the files have, have been removed. All services have been killed. The only way that you would be able to know that this user is infected by Adwin is that if you were using IR and digital forensics and you went back and did uh, 
a uh, historical pull on their system. So. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. I didn't get to the third table, but it's it's pretty much like the other two. Again, I have those on my GitHub page if you guys want to download them and play with the samples. Um, and that one, the third one, you get more into the Smalley code. So if anybody here loves assembly code, you're going to love Smalley because it's basically assembly, but for for uh, Android. So I'll go um, ahead and wrap up. Did, did anybody have any additional questions? Yeah, um, well, a couple. So the first one um, from Hans Enders, um, are mobile malware being released which attack or hamper protective tools such as Prey or Find My Phone? You know, I'm, hmm, that's a really, that's a really good question. I don't know about hampering them. Um, it's a really great question. I know that, that GPS tracking geolocation uh, is huge for a lot of the malware, uh, mainly because they want anti-fraud detection and they want to be able to serve up malware specific to a geolocation, or they mm -hmm. do want to track their, from an APT standpoint or SBNR standpoint, they want to be able to track their target. You know, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I haven't come across any malware that has tried to suppress or or modify prey or find my phone. Mm -hmm. That's um, yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Um, the other question is, um, I think I skipped it. Does a does a rat have uh, does the rat have key loggers in it? It does have key. It does have key loggers. Okay. So you can yeah. So but there's also other malware like lower end malware that you can mm -hmm. do um, uh, keystroke logging on as well. Okay. Okay, and the other question, or two more, uh, one is the easy one. Can you post your GitHub link somewhere? Um, sure can. Let me. Yeah, if you, if you send that to us, we'll put it out. Or if you okay, put I'll it send it with my slide deck. Does that work? Yeah, yeah that'll, okay. that'll work perfect. And then how prevalent is non-Java Android malware? So because... Java is kind of the heart of, well, now Kotlin is now the heart of Android. It's, I mean, you really need to be able to interact with it. The only other way that you could run malware that I'm aware of on an Android device is just leveraging the existing capabilities. So you could, you could maybe modify or leverage like geolocation or things like that. You could do some browser. Um, I think you could do yeah. some browser. I think I've seen redirect on Android, but the majority of what you need for malware to be successful on Android is, is device access, which requires Java or, or Kotlin source code. 